now invites you to spend time with a man who spent more than 30 years as a member of the Grateful Dead family, Steve Parrish. Stephen would answer if it only knew how. The music, memories, and insight begin now with the Big Steve Hour on Sirius XM's Grateful Dead channel. And now, here's Big Steve Parrish. Hi, everybody. Here we are again, together again, and I so love talking to you, all my deadhead brothers and sisters out there, and everybody, everybody who calls himself, anyone who was ever touched by a band or music in any way, I'm speaking to you right now, because the Grateful Dead was something so different in that way, the connection between the fans and the band, we know that that is the most amazing thing about the whole of this fantastic, magical thing that happened, and I want to tell you guys, in the whole time on the road, every day, every Every time you woke up, you opened your eyes on the road and you knew you were in a magic place. It all was built on that. It was built on a phantasmagorical atmosphere of unbelievable people, places, and things. And that combination, I felt so lucky to be there. And I always felt like I was there for each and every one of you. What I experienced, what would you do? Would you have ever turned your back on Jerry the day he asked me to take his guitar and amp? to the Matrix? No, of course not. You would have done anything you could for him, too, because he had that kind of a personality. He was a, a person who you just wanted to be friends with, you know, in every way, because he was Mr. Friend, and he loved people so much. It, it was ironic that he ended up having to be in an ivory tower, in a sense, because so many people loved him. And when you have the love of everybody, you have to parse it out in little pieces here and there. And he did that perfectly. He would love it when I brought people to talk to him or whatever. He, he had this gal in New Jersey, uh, Geraldine was her name, and she was somebody who John Shear found online one time, and she was just this little, nondescript person who you wouldn't believe, and she came to see us all the time at the Capitol Theater in Passaic, New Jersey, and she would talk to Jerry, and Jerry would have me bring her back there in the little dressing room at the Capitol Theater, which was not a very big place. Actually, it was a uh, burlesque theater that John Shear's father had bought in Passaic, and John was a promoter in colleges in New Jersey, and Sam Cutler found him, and we called him the boy promoter, like I say, because we were we, we needed to break away a little bit from Bill Graham, who was booking us everywhere. We, we loved him so much, you know, but there were some people in the band that, that were questioning Bill a lot about his practices and different things, and so John Shear became this other alternative all of a sudden. And he had respect for all of us and the whole thing. And he worked so hard. But he, had, he started out in this place called the Capitol Theater in Passaic, New Jersey. And we would do these shows there. And so can you imagine this girl? I would bring Geraldine back there. And she would have to put up with our entire circus of crazy people. And she'd sit there. Jerry and her would talk about her grandmother and baking little cookies. She was that kind of gal. She would bring... Jerry cookies, you know, and then on that one, another day at the uh, Passaic Capitol, a guy, one of the security guys at the back door hands me a letter and I and it said to Jerry Garcia, you know, so I bring it into Jerry and I hand it to him because it was just there and we, we, we was before the show. And the letter, I'll never forget, Jerry read it to me. It said, my dear little weed. That's how it started. I am your mother. It was very strange. It was a lady who really believed she was Jerry's mom. And she wrote him this heartfelt letter that almost made us choke up. We read it. It was like she just convinced herself that she was Jerry's mom at this time. Now, his mom had passed away a couple of years earlier, and she was a wonderful lady. She, Jerry got a lot of his personality from his mom, and she was a tough gal, too. She ran a bar. You know, I've told you before, it was down near the Maritime Hall, and the seamen that came in there, and I don't mean that kind of seamen, I mean sailors, and the ones that came in there were very much, uh, you know, your rough type of uh, sailors back in those days. They're not, they don't make men like that anymore, do they? Or do they? I think they do. But the thing is that we used to say, you know, it was wooden ships and iron men, and these are the kind of people she dealt with, and she was a strong lady. His dad, who passed early on, was a musician, 
And Jerry got a lot of that side of, of his father, the love of music and the love of the history of music, too, because his dad was a really deep cat, and I wish he'd lived longer so we all could have known him. But he passed early on in Jerry's life, and so Jerry kind of raised himself with his brother Tiff uh, Clifford, who he called Tiff as a childhood nickname, and, you know, they were scruffly kids on the street, and most of us were like that, man. We scruffled on the street and roughed around, and to find the Grateful Dead and to make it become this thing that then opened up to so many of you and became a channel. And Jerry and I would laugh about different things. You know, we loved movies, right? And and there's a movie called Lawrence of Arabia that you might have heard of, you know. And in that scene, there's Anthony Quinn, and he's a, just this amazing a uh, tribal chieftain of his tribe, and they're trying to get him to come in with the coalition in the First World War to actually take back the Ottoman Empire, but let's not go there right now. Anyway, Jerry loved the line in there when Anthony Quinn stood up and he said, I am a river to my people. And Jerry would say that to me sometimes, and we would joke about it. But really think about it. Was he not a river to his people? He was. And he loved each and every one of you so much. How many times he would want the lights turned up in clubs or in shows so that he could look at each one of your eyes and your face to play every note to you, you know, and to have that kind of a thing come out and emanate from him. He gave us all. He, he, he turned to the better angels of all of our lives. And, and so we all raised ourselves up from the dust and the grime of the street to be the Grateful Dead. And that was such a beautiful thing to see, guys and girls. And I want to tell you, you know, when you had that kind of a background, there was a plenty of prejudices, plenty of things that people brought with them into the scene because we were eclectic. We, you know, the, the crew itself was made up, like I talked about in, in the uh, documentary, although uh, I tried to explain that we were like that American thing, me being raised in New York, you know, kid from Alameda, Jackson and Ramrod and Heard from and, and Hagen from small towns in Eastern Oregon, when we came together and other people from other towns were there with us also, when we came together, it was like an all American thing, you know, a, a division of people come together. And so then you had the band in the same way. And to open up that river that we created is such a beautiful thing for me to think of now, you know. And I could tell you how Jerry so loved people. You know, he had a soft heart, a spot in his heart for people that lived on the street and had it the roughest and the, and the people on the lowest level of society at times. And he always noticed that wherever we went, he would point it out to me, look at that guy. And I can remember we'd be in New York and there was this amazing guy, you know, 48th street was where all the music stores were. So we went there a lot and uh, Jerry would go there with me. He loved to go in there and, and, you know, sit and play a guitar and the place would light up people would come into manny's music on 48th and and just hear jerry garcia's playing in there and other guys could play too and those you know there would be guys wailing on guitars all over but all of a sudden the place would come together as jerry would start playing in there and testing out different pedals you know the people there treated us like gods they were always so good to us in that place you know and it was something that we had in every city of America. In Chicago, it was the drum shop there, Marty Lachone and those guys. In Oakland, it was Leo's music. In the days before in San Francisco, it was Roger Calkin, who I was always told was the real backbone to the instruments that the Grateful Dead got in the early days and played. And he was a spiritual leader to the band in that way. And Leo in Oakland would just love us. When we walked in to his place, the place would be crowded with people. The music was so blown apart in the Bay Area. It was so about bringing music to the people. 
And when you walked into a place like Leo's, it was wall to wall people. And Leo would always see us coming in and he'd pull me and Ramrod right to the front. And we would take our time because we were taught, you know, by Mickey to take each drumstick and we would roll them on the counter. We, you didn't buy a drumstick that didn't roll flat. Mickey taught us that, you know, because drumsticks were made and they had curvature in them. Now, we were very good friends with Carol and the people who made Regal Tip drumsticks in Buffalo, New York. They came to all our shows. And as the years went on, when they found out how much we loved the Regal Tip uh, drumstick, they brought them to us in cases and we had cases of them. And so we, we knew they were the finest when they brought them. But in the old days, we used to have to go in and roll them. And then we would buy picks. Jerry played the carp pick that was very hard to find. It was a real thick, clear plastic pick. We only get them at Manny's, you know? So when we went there, we'd always go in and buy all he had. And, and Jerry was like that sometimes with picks. He liked a heavy, heavy pick, you know? And basically what would be a Fender heavy, he would always play that. But when he played acoustic, he liked a heavy ovation pick, you know? And the other day I was listening to another show on Sirius and a guy called in asking technical questions. I was going crazy to answer him for him, you know? But I wasn't there at the time. And and uh, they tried to answer it for him. Another guy called in right after that and was talking about Litchfields, you know, which was really the Bermuda Palms Hotel, which was where we had our, our studio behind there, Front Street, which we built. It was a place we rented for years. Maury Koch, uh, who owned the building, wanted us to buy it, but we never did. We were there for 25, 30 years, and we became our own. But the guy was asking a question about Litchfield. He remembered that sign, and he was talking about uh, when he was a kid, he would get... Um, scones with his dad at a at a Swedish restaurant, he called it. And I knew exactly what he was talking about. The Viking restaurant was right in front of that place. And it was just a Viking sub shop, but they had scones. I wish I could have told that guy that and made put his heart to rest because he would see that picture of the band under Litchfield and he was talking to Gans and Lambert about it. And anyway, little things like that are very interesting to me because Bermuda Palms was and, and Whitey Litchfield who ran that place, you see, he had Pepperland there also, and we played in Pepperland in 1969 and 70. And there was also a place that Whitey was a friend of mine because he rode motorcycle. He was an amazing guy. And he took me in one time into Litchfields, and there was a nightclub in there, and it was locked up. He had locked it up in 1959. And he opened the door and took me in there. And it was like walking back into the 50s, my friends. And it was it had a mural on the wall of the Bay Area that I can remember to this day and showed all the Bay played out as it was. And Litchfield was this amazing place. And in there was this nightclub. Now, if you know the logistics of the time and place, what it became was a blues club. And Whitey locked it up one day because people were actually in San Rafael, where it was, complaining to him about having too much riffraff come through there. And so Whitey, being who he was, took the key and locked it. And when he took me in there, I realized that I was the first person he'd brought in there for maybe 25 years. And he loved us, you know, because he would tell me all about Front Street, where we were. You see, in 1947, he had the sense to buy from there to the bay. And all of that was his own landing strip. He flew a plane, and that where where our studio was. And so it gave me a sense of history of where we were there. And he had this kind of a foresight of certain people that you'll meet in your life, entrepreneurs, you know, I call them. And he loved the Grateful Dead. And this old boy rode a full dress Harley and rode with us all the time. And he was a good companion. But the story of Litchfield is incredible. I first heard about it and couldn't believe it when I was reading 
uh, the <laughs> Guinness Book of Records to the band one day. There it was. I showed him. Bermuda Palms Hotel was where they set the world's record for somebody staying underwater in a pool for more than five minutes. And I, I asked Whitey the first time I met him. I said, Whitey, I know about the pool. <laughs> Tell me. And he took me out and showed me where he cemented over that pool. And he told me that day a guy came out and held his breath, took many, many breaths on the steps and went on the water and another guy stood on his back and kept him down there for about seven minutes and he has the world records. Look it up. It's from Bermuda Palms and that was right there. And see, then this other amazing thing happened. See, around the Grateful Dead, there's nothing but destiny, magic, and beautiful things. And if you ever forget that, my friends, you'll lose your way in this world. Because if you start looking at the mundane part of it. If you start getting and microscoping it so much, you'll see that, you know, but if you look at the macro cosm of the Grateful Dead, you start to understand how it touches everything in life and everything that people hold dear to their hearts comes out in that way. And so Whitey was that kind of a person, you know, to know him and to know that he was there watching out for us in different ways. Uh, was very much a connection that we had. And we made these connections all over the world. It was amazing how people would respond to us. At first, in airports, you know, in the old days, when we would go there, we'd pull up, and they couldn't handle our equipment. And, and, and before all the security stuff, before D.B. Cooper, you could do amazing stuff. And Cutler would, hand, Sam Cutler, would we, we'd pull up with our truck. And can you imagine, we give 20 bucks to a sky cap and he would let us put the Grateful Dead equipment on the plane. He'd take us out on the, on the tarmac. We would get in the plane and load the plane ourselves with this gear and fly to the next town and then get rented trucks and go out. It was always an adventure every time we we hit the road and, and the road lived in our hearts everywhere we went and each and every one of you is connected by that highway see because have you ever looked at traffic have you ever sat there in traffic and look at all the red lights you're seeing on one side and the white lights on the other it's just like in your veins it's just like in your heart and soul it's the way blood cells go through life man they, the highways and the byways which started from Indian trails the highway 80 that goes across the United States was an Indian trail it was then it became the Oregon Trail and you got to understand these connections to history and and because we were on the road and we were there every day you know we learned to feel this pulse of america and the world because when you travel you become part of the pulsating life of of everything in the universe in every piece every little cell has its meaning and jerry knew that and the guys in the band knew that and they played to that microcosm because you take a lot of lsd you start to think about that is not everything in the universe in a drop of water to you if it isn't, then you are drinking the wrong kind of water. Because I'm telling you, it's all there. And Owsley could talk about that stuff, and we could talk about that stuff. And so we lived in a world with one foot in, the, in this world and another foot in this amazing thing that music opens up for you, an eclectic universe of people, places, and things. And every one of you lived that with us. That's the beauty of being a deadhead. That's the beauty of being what we are, you know? And, and so I can remember one night, Jerry called me up. We were in New York, you know, and, and we were looking out the hotel. At that time, it was the Navarro Hotel on Central Park South. And he said, Steve, look out your window right now. And it was a Jerry Garcia tour, actually. And I looked out, and there was this guy, you know. And if you've ever been on the corner in New York of 59th Street in Central Park South, there's a statue of Simon Bolivar, who was the liberator of South America and so much held in esteem in the past that they built a statue of him, and it says that on it. And from behind that statue, Jerry said to me, look, watch that guy. And this was 3 o'clock in the morning. The city was quiet and hardly a movement. And I said, what guy? What are you talking about? And then I saw him. This guy comes creeping out from behind that statue, and he runs out, and he runs over to a, a garbage can, and he turned it upside down, and then he ran back behind the statue. 
And so Jerry said, watch him, watch him. And so sure enough, then he comes back out about five minutes later and he rumbles through that garbage that he dumped out and he finds a bottle and he walked right out in the middle of, of 59th Street and he reared back and he threw that bottle and he hit the traffic sign and knocked it swinging. That he was at war with the city, we realized, fighting his own battle against the world, you know? And I'm not talking about fighting City Hall because everybody knows you don't do that. It's a waste of time. But he was a warrior of the street. And then I could tell you other times when we react to these kind of people, you know, they were out there all the time. And you would see them at night. When we went to Egypt, I can remember the first thing you notice when you're coming in from the airport is there's people in what they call the city of the dead. And they, you see, you can't bury people down in the ground in the sand. And so they're buried on top of the ground. Their sarcophaguses are alive. And people live there. In the shade, any bit of shade in the desert gives you a home. And so I couldn't believe my eyes. Behind a billboard, you'd see sheets hanging and a whole family living behind that. And and then when you looked at the city of the dead outside of Cairo, it went on for seen miles to me of people living among the sarcophaguses and that kind of stuff. When you see it, when you go to New Orleans and you go to those cemeteries there where they have the same problem, they can't bury people down in the earth because the uh, water level, the water table is so high, the graves flood. And so there was once a time when they found a guy buried in New Orleans back in the 1700s, and guess what? His body ended up in the Gulf Stream, and he ended up in New England, in Massachusetts, he washed ashore. And so when you realize that we are all connected by water, if you ever realize that the salt water salinity is the exact same mix as our blood, your blood has the exact same salt content as the ocean. Why do I say this? Not to waste your time. It's because I believe that we are all connected and the Grateful Dead was about that connection. And that is what each and every one of you are. Every person who, who responds to that music or what was created there and what we've now moved on into this century. We're in the 21st century and the Grateful Dead is loud and proud, man. And each and every one of you, I want you to stick your chest out. I want you to look up to the sky and smile when you see it and know that you're proud to be a deadhead. You know what? Because we are a rare breed, my friends, because we take knowledge and we take notice of everything around us, the metaphysical world. That's what Jerry was playing to. That's what Phil was playing to with his unique style of playing. That's what the very concept of two drummers was about when nobody else was daring to try that. And you know what? You got to have courage to do all that stuff. And if you don't have courage, you don't want to be a deadhead because we'll cover you too. Any one of the rest of you get to the rear and you're fine. We'll cover you. But the proud deadheads are out there on the line and I love it. I love going around this country and meeting you all. And I'm going to do more and more of that. And you'll see, because we have to stick together, every one of us, because you know what? We're the people. And the people are what we are. And you can never stop what that means to this planet. Don't think the Grateful Dead was just a band. It was not. And we know that. You know, one time we bought this piece of land and, and, and we were called a deadhead. Jerry had this idea. It was in 1970. And, and, and it cost 70 grand, believe it or not. And we bought 12 acres in Marin County. And we were going to build deadhead Dead Patch, Jerry called it, like Dog Patch out of a famous comic strip, Little Abner, which we loved. And, you know, if you ever read Little Abner, it was a the town of Dog Patch was a great little community, man. There was funny people. There was crazy people. And there was just like a dead concert almost. And so Dead Patch was going to be like that. Jerry had this vision of us building our compound and having a studio there. We built a barn studio like we were using at that time at Mickey's Place and at, at, at Rucka Rucka. And so it was an extension of that. And, and the roadies were going to have houses there. And whoever the band guys would have a house or two if they wanted to live there. And we loved it. It was part of what was called the Bulltail Ranch, which which actually actually now became Lucas Valley and George Lucas bought all of that because 
we ran out of money and we had to sell it. But the thing is, we knew in our hearts, we carried dead patch with us wherever we went. And every one of you is uh, welcome to that compound because I'm going to be at the gate to that place, man. And I'm going to see, look you in the eyes. And I'm going to know by looking in your eyes that your soul is a beautiful soul of someone who was touched by the Grateful Dead. And we're all going to be together partying forever up there, okay? And you get me on this, you know? Because in these times and days... You know, we, the other day I played a gig uh, with Moon Alice at the Odd Fellows Hall in Auburn, and I was walking around looking at what they were about. You know, I never realized it. When you have these places like the the lodges, the Benevolent Order of the Elks, you know, we'd see them everywhere. And, and when we used to have to play in a lot of those places, because those places are now... Uh, lodges are defunct a little bit and they need to make money and so they like having shows in there. But the history in them is amazing and the attempt at trying to bring people together is what they were about. Started reading the creed to the odd fellows, and they sounded like they were deadheads to me, man. Take all kinds of brother. And they had a triple triangle that says love, peace, and harmony, pretty much, you know? And is that not what we're about? So you see our connection to everything that is the best of the best of people. Because I've seen it in my own eyes, you know, when a brother or sister at a dead concert is having a problem, that problem is taken care of. The ones that get in trouble, I always noticed over the years, were the deadhead that would walk out of the concert and, and wander out. And then you never knew what was going to happen out there. And some of them went, wound up in trouble because then you're dealing with the man. And that's a different thing. You see, that's the part of the, the safety of the dead show, of the dead and company show, of the Phil and Friends show, of whatever. You're safe in there amongst your people and your brotherhood of sisterhood of us all is so strong. And, you know, when we went to the Us Festival a long time ago, uh, the first one ever we played at, and Bill Graham, my dear friend, he said... You know, he and I had spent the night before, I've talked about this, we, we we were up all night. He told me every inch of his life that night and so many great stories about what he, the hardships that he had been through in his life because he was born, unfortunately, in a place in Europe at a time in Europe when you had to flee for your life. He had to leave his family and they were all dead as far as he knew. And he made it to the United States. And so he kissed the ground every day in a way, in his own way. And he he would tell me things about that, you see. And so at the Us Festival, he came up to me, and there was a million people there. It was the first one. It was huge. And him and Wozniak from Apple put it on together. Wozniak came to Bill, and he wanted, you know, this this festival to happen. And then it sort of evolved into what's Coachella. And <laughs> anyway, you know, it became this thing. And so Bill walked up to me and he said, I'll give you $10,000, Steve, right now, if you walk out on the, while the Grateful Dead were playing. He said, start dancing in the middle of the stage. And God darn, I wanted that 10 grand so bad. I was trying to buy a house at the time. I was trying to do some things for my family. I was thinking about all this stuff, and he had me going crazy because I knew that I'd seen other people who couldn't stop but dance at the Grateful Dead. And when you dance, when you're moved to dance for a band, that's the highest compliment you can pay them because what you're doing is you're becoming an antenna in the universe of their music because why if you look at the most primitive sources of dance and you see how beautiful they dance when they're high they usually are high too in any most primitive thing in the amazon jungles in the equatorial africa in the jungles of southeast asia in anywhere you go in this world in singapore in bali you'll feel the dance and the mickey would teach us about the gamelong and how the the primal instinct of man is to dance and when you think about it you know it, it, music is inspiring to us and when you dance you put that out and so 
I had to overcome something I realized because I'd seen other guys who worked for the band and they couldn't stop. They, when they danced, they couldn't work, you know, and so we didn't dance much, let me tell you. But I grabbed the cl closest thing and Jerry happened to be drinking rum and Coke that day and I tried to down this bottle of rum and I just walked out there, but I didn't dance because the band all looked at me when I walked out on stage and thought I was, I could have got, I could have danced and they would have just laughed at me, but I didn't do it and I regretted it so much later and Bill said, oh, you couldn't do it, could you? Now, not to mention that the night before you told me about uh, there's a was a beautiful guy named Enrico Banducci who lived in North Beach and he was our friend too in North Beach where we played the nightclubs and he had a place called Enrico's and it was right on Broadway in San Francisco and it was a hangout in the back in the day and you know when the Purple Onion was right across the street and guys like Lenny Bruce hung out there and all the beatniks from North Beach and Enrico was a great guy and Bill had told me a story the night before about he was in there eating dinner late one night and he was with this girl and he got her to dance on the table by putting money out to her so somehow that story popped back in my head and I didn't do it but what a fool I was. <laughs> anyway, the thing is, the dance of the Grateful Dead is the greatest honor you could pay them, you know, and always. And they would have laughed at me, of course, for a minute, but they still love me, of course. And the thing is that I love you guys. We used to always have dancing girls on stage with us because it was something that we felt was, was a, a connection. It was another round in the circle, you know? And, and when people would be so stoned out of their minds, they felt like they had to come up there on the altar of the Grateful Dead, the stage, and be there. I looked at it as if they were paying a tribute of the highest order. But of course, we had to be careful because they would break equipment. They would try to hug the guys while they were playing. They would try to, uh, you know, be ridiculously naked in the middle of it all. And, and that was beautiful in a way. They were sweating. They were strong because when someone's so high to do that, remember their adrenaline is pumping through their body. And so the littlest person could be as strong as the biggest person. It doesn't matter on that. And you don't want to hurt them. And so you had to use such, such a way of like, if you've ever seen this movie, which we did the soundtrack for called El Topo. And so this movie, El Topo, tells the story in such an amazing way of how you journey through life in the desert, trying to find all, you bump into all these people on your journey who try to bring you up to a higher level. In other words, there was a scene in it where a guy was thrown this amazing ball of geodesic woven fibers. And if you touched it too strong, it broke in your hand and just disappeared and, and just went away. But if you caught it just right, you could hold it for a second. And that's what the Grateful Dead was kind of, at a, a moment in the music. You could hold that moment, but if you held it too hard, it would shatter and break. And when you knew that everybody that was up there making that, when you saw somebody coming from the back of the hall, stripping their clothes off in all their glory to jump up there, it was to me something that was to be respected in a sense. You, you could not only because, let's say, I don't have the hang-ups of the human body like some people might have. I think it's a beautiful thing. And I, I, I just hate it when people think that art is not representative of man and woman, because it is. And each and every one of us is art. We are a working piece of art. And that's what that was all about, you know? And all the people that came through our scene, whether they be rough and tumble, hell's angels or friends or whatever, they were art. And they had a lot of art on their body. I can remember this uh, big Vinny in New York telling me, hey, Steve, I've got you know, to tell you something. And I said, what, Vinny? He said, they say that if you got four tattoos, you're a felon. He said, I got 73. What does that make me? And I said, that makes you special, my friend. And you know, it was. And because if you express your art in your way, and a lot of people do that in different ways, you know, like Sonny Hurd, who worked on our crew, uh, he, he was wild as the wind, man, and he died by the gun, man. He was shot and killed, trying to be 
this character that he really wasn't, but he was tough as nails, and he was a hard guy. And we'd go into bars sometimes on the road, and he would start it off. He'd pick the most redneck person in the whole place who you wouldn't even want to talk to. You know, he'd be kind with a ripple on the back of his neck and, and for sure not a, not a hair on his head longer than uh, an eighth of an inch. And he'd walk up to the guy and he said, I'll bet you I got a cock that hangs below my knees. And they would just get mad and laugh at us. They, first of all, they wanted to fight us because we had long hair and, and we smelled like weed and, and we had tie dyes on in those days. And sure enough, Herd would bring his leg up, his pant leg up, after the guy would throw a $10 bill down and say, nobody has that. And then he would show him. There, he had a rooster tattooed on underneath his knee with a with a, a hang noose on his neck, and the eyes crossed out, just like a comic rooster. So there was a rooster hanging there below his knees, and some people call a rooster that other word that I just said, and so he would win that money. But then you had to fight the guys, you see, after that. They didn't like that. They didn't think that was fair play. And so when you went out in America, where you were us, we had to hit the welding edge of America with the police, the truckers, the truck stops. The, the places in America that we first had to go through were not welcome. You've all seen Easy Rider. If you haven't, you better go out and see it. That was what it was like in those days, you know? You didn't know if your life was in danger sometimes. Why'd you do it? You did it because you knew at the end of the day, the Grateful Dead were going to play the next day if you stayed alive and made it to that next gig and did your job. And what a great job that was to do. Can you imagine that? You know, the the feeling of knowing that you created that music when we would every day that we built the wall of sound, it almost about killed us but you looked at that thing and it was like moving the pyramids from one place to the other every day it was something that no one else is ever going to do now i realize that now and, and i realized what we did by teamwork and brotherhood and friendship and something that i got to experience because we did it for you guys you know what and you would have done it for me too and i remember that you know and and there was a guy jonathan reister he was just so wild, man. This guy, he, he, he was, he, he came around and he was a road manager when I first came around, but he was also a cowboy and he loved to brag about how he got his teeth knocked out at the Fillmore West by, by shooting his mouth off to a hell's angel, you know, but, uh, he also was the kind of guy I remember at Jackson's funeral, him telling me he to come to mind. That's what he said to me. That's simple because he was long out of our scene and he came back just to pay his respects to that brotherhood of the road that we all had, you know, have you ever been on the road with any of your friends? When you guys traveled from show to show, you have experiences and things that bound you together. When you camped on somebody's lawn that night and they were woke up in the morning and realized it was a farmhouse and they didn't like you being there, you have a story to tell. Because you know what? That happened to us too many times. Be Places we tried to get out of Blossom in the middle of Ohio, bus would get off the road on some little farm road, and you'd knock on the door. You think they met us with coffee and cake? Not always, my friends. They were quite shocked. What was this band doing out in the middle of our field in the middle of the night? And so, if ever, my dear friends, you find yourself straying off the path of righteousness or the world seems to be closing in on you, remember that we're all in this together and we're all there together. And if we put our heads together, we'll figure it out. Never give up on your deadhead friends and never give up on how weird they are because they're always going to be weird. And weirdness is a great thing. As Jerry loved to call everybody, he's a freak. That was his title of endearment for you. When he called you a freak, you knew you made it with him, man, because he loved freaks because he felt he was a freak and one of the biggest. And, you know, sometimes you can hurt somebody's feelings if you call them a freak. They might not understand it. But I take it as a badge of proudness because of the way it was in that sense, you know. And when we used to sing Mama Tried and dedicate it to the crew, I was kind of proud in a way. I was really proud. I remember when I, I finally passed 21 and didn't, uh, wasn't in prison without a life without parole. I knew that we'd actually met some kind of accomplishment, you see. And so, you know, you can set your bar in life as high as you want to. 
we were exposed to the great artists, too, of all around us. Poets like Ginsberg came to our shows. Lenore Kandel, L- uh, Ferlinghetti, and, and people like that were attached to us. Kesey and all the people he knew. And William Burroughs. These are people we got to meet and talk to. And they were, they were just amazing people because they chose their art. You know, K- Kesey with a pen could write from the heart and soul of a person. And, you know, read sometimes a great notion, and you'll see what I'm talking about. He could see that in people. He could talk about a logger, and he could talk about a hippie in the same breath, man, because he knew them both. And he taught me that, that you don't ever turn your back on somebody because they don't look right. You know, Babs, who was a wonderful guy, Ken Babs, he, he... he was amazing. He was a Marine captain in 1965, and his beautiful book out, The Water Buffalo, Who Shot the Water Buffalo, tells the story of life in 1965 and 66 in Vietnam. And he still came out of that to be an amazing guy who led the whole charge of the pranksters and went everywhere. And you can be two or three different peoples. I've, I told you before about Paige Browning. In the middle of an acid test, he went, huh two, three, four, marched out the door and joined the Marines. And this kind of thing, you go from that to that. And then he came back and he was better for it. You know why? Because he saw both sides of life and he came out with a love for this thing. And when you had people like that all around the Grateful Dead, you know, um, some of them snapped bad and we had to take care of them. But our friends that were hurt really bad by stuff like that, veterans who were never going to be the same. We took them in. Brian Wilson Williams was one of the guys. He was hurt so bad, but we let him hang out and work with us because nobody else could understand him. He could never get over what he'd been through. But he worked with us, you know, and, and we had sympathy for him. And he loved that, you know, but we never went overboard politically to ever take a stance. Why you get put in a certain place in your life in this world no one knows my friend and so if you're standing there and you're at a dead and company show and you're looking up at the stage and you're feeling the history of the grateful dead come through to you you're doing something good for the planet baby you're doing something real good for everyone around you too and i want to play a song right now because the feeling just hit me So let's together listen to this. Because somehow it means something. The words that Hunter wrote, the music that the band would play, create so many of these amazing songs. These songs, each one of them, are like prayers or hymns going up to the sky. And you can always find solace in that. So this one's a little different, but let's play it.
Dave Hour on the Grateful Dead Channel. Now, you see that song right there? That tells you a lot. You know, that tells you about the eye. Hunter was like that, too. Hunter could have a feeling for people, and he kept so much of it inside. Sometimes you'd look at him and you'd think, is he going to explode right now with what's inside him? And one day, I have told this story before, but it so bears for the holiday season to think about miracles sometimes, you know? And a strange thing happened one night, a very, very dark night around this time of year. Many years ago, we were rehearsing the Jerry Garcia Band at Front Street at night, late at night. And, you know, we were kind of there hanging out, and uh, uh, you know that we substance abused at times and tried to change the things. And so it was there we were in the nighttime, and, and Bob Matthews had gone over to the 7-Eleven, and he comes back with all these cans of these pre-mixed cocktails that were very, very silly. You've probably seen them. I don't even remember what they're called anymore, but they were like, you know, screwdrivers in a can, okay? And so we start drinking them, and and, and Jerry has a couple, and, and we're out there, and the guys are playing, you know? And a few minutes after that, in comes Hunter. And Hunter had been dumpster diving right near uh, our studio. There was a lot of dumpsters in that industrial area, and he saw these these shoes sitting on the top of a pile of garbage, and they caught his eye, and he was coming down there to hang out with us that night, you know, and he stopped his car and pulled over and lifted these shoes out of the dumpster, and he told me he put them on, and these shoes were white patent leather, and they were way big. They were about size 12s, I'd say. You know, I wear a 14, and they were too small for me, but Hunter tried wearing them, and they were too big for him. And so he comes in holding these white patent leather shoes that you know whoever tossed them in there was either wearing leisure suits in those days uh, or else it wasn't anybody who dressed like we did. Let me put it that way. And Jerry was playing, and he was in a buzzed type of uh, mentality. And so he saw those white shoes that Hunter bringing them in. He said, give me those. And he took, kicked his, his shoes off. He called them kicks. He kicked his kicks off, and he put those white shoes on. And they were a little big on him, right? So he could rock back and forth while he was playing on them. They were like skis, in a sense, of, of a magical sense of skis. And suddenly I realized, you know, that these shoes had a story to them. And these shoes, I wish I'd have known who put them in that dumpster. But I can only imagine that it was some story that was mystical and magical. Because Jerry began to play in a way that I'd never heard him play before. And the whole big was playing with them, you know, and uh, Ron Tutt was playing drums and Khan was playing bass and Matthews was recording a little bit. Suddenly this music came out of Jerry and he was playing away and I was kind of laying back on, a, on this couch that we had out there listening to him, smoking a joint. And after a while, I had to look at him, say, where is this coming from? And these shoes he was rocking back and forth on. And by golly, I looked at him, and he was fast asleep. He was playing in his sleep, ladies and gentlemen. And his eyes were closed, just like a baby, just like his mama had tucked him in in his little cradle and pulled his little blanket over him. He was there, but he was playing guitar, just like he was awake. And I, I, look, I walked up to him, and I looked right in, in his eyes and his face, and, and I looked at everybody else, and we all kind of smiled, and we realized that he was fast asleep. He was snoring. And when you heard Jerry snore, okay, Jerry was not, you know, there's snores in this world, and you've heard people snore, and people try to, you know, make like they don't and they get embarrassed when Jerry snored rattled the freaking walls I'm, I'm serious if you didn't when you roomed with him you had to fall asleep before he did you knew when 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 he got to that time of night and he was getting tired you look over at his bed and you say oh shit I better get to sleep right now and if you couldn't fall asleep at the snap of a finger you couldn't because you were there in this thing <laughs> And, you know, he would do that on airplanes and wherever he fell asleep, but he was doing it and playing guitar this time. 
And so I got so close to him, he woke up with a start and he looked at me and, he, and then he, he told me the story. I said, you were asleep, man. And he, and he told me the story about how he learned in the army to sleep while he was marching. And if you can think about that, when you're in close quarters and you are marching, if you ever had to do close drill with other people, then you understand that you are held up by your brothers. You see what's around you is holding you up. And so you can, at one moment in time, actually leave your mind and go to a better place because you're not in a happy place if you're marching in uniform with other people. And so he learned to sleep while he was marching. And so he, Jerry was not the kind of guy to do that normally. And so this night I had to not, uh, put it up to those shoes and those shoes became like a magic thing. And he wore them for about a week or two, man. And then he finally looked at me and he said, throw these away. And he took them off, you know, but, you know, what did uh, Marshall McLuhan, now look him up, too, if you don't know who he is, but we would read all these books, and he claimed that the clothing and, your, and everything is an extension of your skin, and it is. You see, it is. And so we used to all wear tie-dyes all the time, man. If you look at pictures of the band, everybody did because they were made. If you would go and stay in the Haight-Ashbury at somebody's house, another, you know, you, you met somebody and you stayed with them, in the morning, sometimes they would tie-dye all your clothes they'd be there you'd wake up you go hey thanks you know because it was just white t-shirts or or nondescript ones then that t-shirt thing went out of control but the tie-dyes were so beautiful when people would do them with their meager little uh, ways of rubber banding them and and dyeing shirts everybody know now knows about that and there's so many people that have t- had a flair for it and and done such a great job uh, you know we, we we had to display our freak flag quite freely by putting that all over our equipment. We pulled those old Fender front boards off and put tie-dyes on them. And our, our wall of sound had, didn't have any tie-dye fronts, but our PA that we built before that, which some of it went into, where every one of those was tie-dyed. When we took to Europe, we had tie-dyed everything we had. And so we loved that kind of a thing because it represented that thing in your mind of beauty and color and the rainbow exploding out of you and coming out to everyone years later we did all subdue ourselves into black t-shirts but that started for a different practical reason of when jerry realized he didn't have to change his shirt as much you see and he could he could build up a, a different kind of uh layer of grit on himself and I did it and started wearing black because we blended in better I started realizing that you know maybe we should be more like the stage hands in in legitimate stage which I had worked at times and and they like to blend in and you don't want to be too ostentatious out there and so we used to wear these tie dyes and we'd go into the hotels in those days and people right away would and you went in Montana you know in Missoula Montana and you're all tie dyed and you're eating breakfast Oh, the waitresses would think we were in showbiz right away. They'd say, you guys must be in show business. Yeah, that's why we're eating 6 o'clock in the morning here uh, going out to do showbiz because the wall of sound took that out of you. But we were men of steel. We were men of iron. And we were on those ships of wood, which is what that was, you see. And the stage was our place because what is a band but a ship out on the sea sailing on the waves? And if you can't pull your weight, if you can't haul that barge if you can't pull that rope you ain't worth it to anybody man and so you got to pull your weight in life too. turn to the grateful dead and find your inspiration and you know what get out there and do it and make somebody else happy you don't got to turn everybody on to the band have it be your secret thing if you want if you want to turn people on to it go ahead because i love when the young people call and they want to know what we went through and what it was like to do that i always felt that to have the to suffer the slings and arrows of taking the grateful dead around to take those punches to take those those slams those insults those whatever and you had to go through in a truck stop where a waitress wouldn't even look at you because you had long hair it was because we were being something different we were trying to show people that difference didn't matter and and you can't be that way to go through life you've got to love people for who they are no matter what they look like never judge a book by its cover but always judge a book by the inside of it and the outside of it will come to you then 
understand. Because if you don't understand the inside, then you'll never understand the outside. If you understand the outside, you will understand the inside. But if you look at something and you hear a music thing that suddenly gets your attention, you're hearing that thing that the muse has put there before you thrown down to you by the gods of creation and everything holy to all of us. Oh, yes. To go through life, dancing and tripping is a beautiful thing. And don't ever stop, no matter what they tell you. Now look at the way the rest of the world is drawing up to us, my friends, and realizing that the psychedelic life actually improves your life. Uh, we knew it from the beginning. The first time I remember watching with Jerry, these guys were up a tree in South America, and one guy with a bamboo pole empty blew this stuff up the other guy's nose, and his eyes turned red, and his, they glowed with the glow of psychedelia because they were doing their thing, you know? And we used to try to grind up nutmeg when we had nothing else and drink it to get high. And we smoked bananas and we tried everything. Thank goodness we had great weed and great things like chemical things to keep us going and to keep us moving through life. But the problems now is that people, when they do, if you take a, any kind of chemical and use it like a crutch, then it's going to be that. It's going to hang you back. It's going to make it so that you aren't strong enough to keep going and walking. Don't ever mistake that. Don't ever let anybody tell you that the drugs that we took held us back in that way because we took them to move forward. We took them to kick from a, a prop plane by plane to a Jet propelled supersonic Jimmy by cracky machine, and that's what we are now. And we ain't never gonna stop, right? I love you all so much, you know, that I don't know where I'm at right at this moment, except I'm here with you, and I feel good. And I hope I touch somebody's heart out there right now because we all had to sweat and go through this together. And don't think that anything. Any one person in the farthest row in the back wasn't played to by that band, man. They were always playing to that guy in the farthest seat out there. And thank you all. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for your love and attention and, and the response that we get on this show and, and the wonderful things that all the producers and, and the people at Sirius try to do for us. And, and all of my friends, Melissa Marshall and, and, and Gordon, who helped me on this show all the time, and Maggie in New York, she knows who I mean. Lou Brutus, he's out there too, and he runs the Dead Channel. And look for those white shoes and grab them out of the dumpster and put them on and don't care what anybody says. And if you fall asleep, wake up real quick and get, it, get yourself moving again. That's all that is. Good Bye, my friends, until the next time we meet again. And looking forward to talking to each and every one of you. If I could just grab you right now, I'd give you all a big hug. Talk to you later. You've been listening to The Big Steve Hour with Steve Parrish. Catch a new show Wednesday at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific on The Great.